Hello everyone, and welcome to lecture 18 in our course on general psychology. And here we're going to begin a new unit, and that is a unit on higher level cognition. So today we will talk about consciousness. In our next lecture we'll talk about thinking, decision making, problem solving, this sort of thing. So this is a two lecture unit. Okay, so we're talking about consciousness. Uh, and right off the bat, we have a difficulty. Uh, trying to define consciousness can be quite hard. Uh, also, what properties constitute consciousness? What, the, what abilities or capacities do you have to have to be conscious? Uh, as we'll see, there are also levels of consciousness. So consciousness is not necessarily uh, something you just have or don't. Uh, you may vary in levels of consciousness throughout your day. Uh, and also, what enters our consciousness? What do we have in mind uh, on a daily basis? How do we occupy our minds? What, uh, what do our minds do uh, when we're not actively engaged in a task, or when we are engaged in a task, but it doesn't require a lot of mental effort? effort. So what we're going to do uh, is first see that consciousness is hard to define, but it's even harder to measure uh, because it's inherently subjective. Uh, we'll also see that it isn't all or nothing. We have levels of consciousness, consciousness, and you will probably exhibit each of these levels in a given day. Uh, there's also the question of whether other animals have consciousness, if they exhibit certain levels of consciousness. Uh, we'll also see that we have an unconscious, uh, and our definition of that concept has evolved over time, uh, but the point is that we don't control everything about our mental process. Uh, there are things we're not aware of. There are things that we can't do. So first, what is consciousness? Uh, so, going to your book, it's a person's subjective experience of the world and the mind. So both of those things. We have the external environment, uh, and we have the internal psychological world of the person. Uh, and this idea of subjectivity uh, gives rise to what's known as phenomenology, uh, which is how things seem to other people. Uh, the classic example is, if I see something uh, and I refer to it as red, what I actually experience, that redness, uh, may be different from your experience. Because we learn the same definition, we learn the same examples maybe, we can both refer to the same object as being red. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that my experience of redness is the same as your experience of redness. So that is the idea of phenomenology. Uh, and, and the reason consciousness is so hard to measure uh, is that we cannot inhabit someone else's mental world. We have no way of recreating someone else's mental state in our own mind. So the emphasis here is on subjectivity. Uh, everyone has their own mental world, has their own set of experiences, uh, and there's no way to recreate that for other people. Uh, we may never be able to. So, your book doesn't mention this, but there is what's known as the easy and the hard problem of consciousness. The easy problem is perhaps you can measure someone's brain, and given that you've recorded what they've experienced so far in terms of stimuli, you might be able to guess what it is they're experiencing now oh, this pattern of neural activity corresponded earlier uh, to when they were seeing a rabbit. Uh, the hard problem is knowing what that experience is like for that person because consciousness is, again, this inherently subjective phenomenon. Uh, and this brings up the problem of other minds. Uh, that is, we know that we're conscious. We sort of assume that other people are, uh, but very hard to prove that. So what, what constitutes a mind? What are the components of mind? And how do minds vary? Are they as conscious as we are, not as conscious? Uh, and so experiments have, have been done looking at people's assessment uh, of other quote-unquote minds. Uh, and when people give these, these ratings, uh, they seem to break down along two dimensions. Uh, one is experience. Uh, that is, the degree to which the entity or being uh, feels emotions, 
is able is, is aware of the state of their body in response to it. So things like pain, pleasure, uh, anger, happiness, can they experience these things? Uh, and the other dimension is what's known as agency, uh, which is the organism, organism's ability to make decisions, to plan ahead, uh, to sort of determine their own environment uh, and their own fate, so to speak. Um, and, and you can vary on both of these dimensions. So people say that babies, for example, uh, have a pretty full set of experiences. They can feel hunger and respond to it. Uh, they can feel pain and respond to it. Uh, they have emotions. But they don't have a lot of agency. They don't have the mental capacity to plan ahead. Um, and, and so they have one dimension, but not the other. Uh, of course, people rate themselves as being high on both. Uh, people rate things like robots uh, as being low in experience. They don't really feel things, uh, but higher on agency. So robots can be programmed to plan, to make decisions in response to the environment. So they don't really feel, but they can think in one way or another. Uh, so that's the problem of, of other minds, is uh, the question of whether other people have consciousness. And if so, to what degree do they have it? How do we measure or prove that other people are conscious. It also brings up the mind-body problem. And this is a very old problem. In fact, if we go back to our uh, one of our early lectures talking about Descartes, uh, where Descartes had the idea that the mind was somehow non-physical. There was the brain, which is part of the body, and then you have the mind. Uh, and the problem is how do those two relate to one another? Now, psychologists today uh, the, the tendency is to think that the mind is sort of what the, what the brain does. Uh, the mind is to a certain degree software, and the brain is the hardware. Uh, and we think this for a number of reasons. Uh, first, if you, if you wipe out parts of the brain, you start to lose capacities. And if this were a non-physical mind, why would you, why would you lose capacities uh, if your mind can manipulate your body, and your body is just sort of stuff? Uh, so that, that, that is one of the main reasons that we, uh, we think that the brain is what uh, it, it produces the mind. Uh, we can also record, we can observe the brain and see that experiences produce activity, neural activity, uh, and these seem to correspond to mental processes and functions. Uh, on a related note, part of consciousness is also uh, awareness, but, all, but our ability to make decisions to think. Uh, and there's some interesting implications when it comes to some psychological experiments and the concept of free will. So we all like to think we have free will. We don't want to think of ourselves as uh, automatons that are bound to a certain fate. Um, and, but there's some interesting experiments on uh, looking at people make arbitrary decisions. So they make a movement when a certain stimulus comes up. Um, but th th they decide whether to make a movement or not. They, they make a decision of some sort. Uh, what's interesting is that there are a number of ways this experiment has been done. Uh, they're looking at some sort of visual stimulus, whether it's a clock or a string of letters, uh, and they're told to remember what position the clock was in uh, or what letter was on the screen when they consciously made the decision to move. The fascinating part is that if you record from the person's brain, you can predict whether they're going to move before, not a long time before, but part, you know, half a second before, uh, you can predict that they're going to make that decision before they're even consciously aware of it. So you can, the brain activity occurs, then the person is consciously aware of making the decision, and then they make the decision, uh, which brings up some interesting questions about our ability to make decisions, or about our ability to determine uh, our own lives. Uh, now, some definitions of free will do not depend on unpredictability. This would not disrupt that account of free will, uh, but some do. Some people say, well, if you can predict what I'm going to do at any moment, um, then do I really have free will? And some people say yes, some people say no. Uh, so, again, this is, this is all, this is getting toward a philosophical debate, but it's one that psychological data 
uh, have some bearing on. Okay, so we have a basic definition of consciousness. We have a subjective experience of the world and our own minds. Uh, what, what, what does it mean to be conscious? What are the properties of consciousness? Uh, one is intentionality. And that is that our consciousness uh, is directed toward a target of some sort. Now, it may be a focus on some stimulus out in the environment. It could be another person. Uh, it could be something we're seeing. Uh, it could also be something in our minds. Uh, maybe it's a memory we've called up. Maybe it's something we're imagining. Uh, maybe it's an internal emotional experience. Maybe it's a decision we're mulling over. Uh, but our consciousness is pointed at something uh, regardless. So there's always something that our consciousness is directed at. And that's the idea of intentionality. Uh, related concepts are uh, one of unity, uh, which is where we have all these different senses. We have all the sensory information coming in. Uh, but we have a unified experience of the world. So we have a visual stream coming in, we have auditory streams, uh, maybe odors that we're detecting, uh, and yet our mind is not composed of disjointed agents that process these senses separately. We have an integrated experience of the world, and we have a, a sense of being a single entity that experiences that world, and that is unity. Uh, there's also selectivity, uh, which is our ability to focus on some events and experiences and to screen others out. Uh, one example of this is what's known as the dichotic listening task. Uh, and this is where a person is wearing headphones. Uh, and while normally headphones present more or less the same auditory stimulus to each ear, uh, the dichotic part here means that a different stimulus is being played to each ear. Uh, and the person can really only pay attention to one of those streams. And, but they can select which stream that is. Uh, some interesting things about this experiment uh, are that people are generally unaware uh, of what's happening in the ear that they're not paying attention to. Uh, but they're not totally oblivious to it. So some of that information is still getting in. So if something utters their name in that unattended ear, uh, or if the language changes, or the speaker changes, um, that can be noticeable. Uh, what's also interesting, uh, and then your book doesn't mention this, uh, is, is that clearly some of it's getting in because if you have a sentence that starts in one ear and ends in the other, and the opposite occurring in the other ear, so we have a different sentence that starts in the other ear and ends up on the other. Uh, we have two sentences that sort of switch. People will switch their attention to the other ear automatically so that the sentence makes sense, uh, which again suggests that information must be coming in from the other ear, otherwise you wouldn't be able to make that switch. There's also what's known as the cocktail party effect or the cocktail party phenomenon. Uh, and that is to say that if you're in a noisy environment with lots of stimuli, especially auditory stimuli, you're st still able to have a conversation with someone else in, that, in, in the room, uh, even if other stimuli are louder. So we're not automatically distracted by the loudest thing in the room. Uh, we can have some control over what it is we're processing, what it is we're experiencing. Uh, and then finally, there's the idea of transience. Uh, and transience uh, is the idea that our, our consciousness, its contents, are always changing. Uh, we have a stream of consciousness. We'll be thinking about different things from one moment to the next. Uh, even in a constant environment. Uh, and this is, of course, problematic for a behaviorist account uh, of, of behavior, where behaviorists, of course, didn't worry about the inner world of the person, didn't worry about the mind. Uh, but the contents of the mind can change and can affect our behavior. We can imagine something uh, or be distracted, uh, and although there's no physical behavior associated with that, uh, there is an internal process that's different and that can affect our behavior. Uh, this figure here is what's called the Necker Cube. We've all probably seen this before. Uh, but if you stare at this for a while, the stimulus does not change. And yet you might perceive that upper right square as being the back of the cube in some moments and the front of the cube in other moments. And that can switch. Uh, and again, it can switch without actually changing anything about the stimulus. You're just staring at it. 
but something about your internal process causes your perception to change. So that is the property of transient. Uh, and of course, a lot of this has to do with another process we call attention. Uh, now, we're not going to talk about attention really in this course, uh, but it, it gets a lot of research uh, devoted to it. Uh, so things like selectivity are attentional processes. Uh, things like intentionality have an attentional component. So we choose what to pay attention to, uh, and it screens out other extraneous stimuli. So there's a very tight relationship between attention and consciousness, but we're not going to get to talk a lot about attention in this course. Now, and when it comes to consciousness, there are different levels. Uh, and, and we don't always occupy the same level of consciousness. We're not always as aware of our environment and our minds under some circumstances uh, as we are during others. Uh, so there's a level that we call minimal consciousness. Uh, and this can occur during sleep, or you might even call the person unconscious. Uh, but the fact is, there's still some sensory processing going on. When your alarm clock goes off, even if you're asleep, you can still respond to that sensory stimulus. Uh, if you couldn't, there wouldn't be much point in having an alarm clock. So you are minimally conscious. You are not self-aware. You're not thinking about yourself or uh, really thinking deeply about what's going on around you. Uh, but clearly, some sensory information is getting in and being processed. Uh, and you can generate some behavioral output. Uh, so even a sleeping person, even if they stay asleep, uh, they can still respond to the environment. Uh, we have to be careful, though, on that behavioral output front, because uh, the person can provide behavioral output, uh, but just because they don't doesn't mean that they're less than minimally conscious. Uh, so here, for example, is a figure from another book, uh, but when you ask a person while you're scanning their brain, uh, to think uh, about, about a question. Uh, they can change their brain activity based on whether the answer is yes or no. Uh, so we can read out the answers to yes or no questions based on someone's brain activity. And of course that requires them to perceive the question, to understand it, and to answer it. Uh, even people in what we call a, a persistent vegetative state, uh, where they are unresponsive, physically. Uh, for some of them, there still may be mental processing going on. So this bottom part of the diagram uh, shows the brain scan of an individual. Obviously, the brain has been damaged. It looks very different from the brain at the top. Uh, and yet, they're still able to answer yes or no questions, not verbally, not physically, not by moving, uh, but by changing some aspect of their mental process. So we can see different levels of brain activity in certain regions uh, based on their answer to yes or no questions. Uh, so there, there is no physical behavioral output, and yet clearly sensory processing is going on, and to answer the question, the person has to have some level of awareness. Uh, so again, the, the link between behavioral output and minimal consciousness is not entirely probative. You can't depend on behavioral output as your asset. Uh, the next level up is full consciousness, uh, and this is where we add awareness. So the person is aware of their environment. Uh, if you suddenly ask them a question about their environment, they can answer. Uh, so they are processing sensory stimuli. Uh, they will have some internal mental process, uh, and they are aware of it to some degree. They can, again, answer questions about it if queried. Uh, the third level is self-consciousness. Uh, and this incorporates an element of attention to the self, uh, the thinking of the self uh, as an object or an entity. Uh, so this is an additional component. We tend to use the term self-conscious as sort of a negative uh, to mean that we're overly concentrating on some aspect of our appearance or, or our behavior. Uh, but what we mean here is simply uh, that you are not just aware of your environment, uh, but you're aware of yourself, your own mental processes. You're able to monitor your own behavior in a detailed fashion. Uh, so we have those three levels. Uh, and of course, there's a question as to whether animals are conscious. Now, animals come in a variety of forms, obviously, uh, and so they probably have different levels of consciousness. Uh, so how do we assay consciousness in animals? 
Uh, now, what's what's interesting uh, is that different animals seem to have different mental abilities. Uh, some animals seem to be able to recognize themselves in a mirror. Certain primates, dolphins, probably even elephants, uh, when they see a mirror, they don't think of that image uh, as another member of their species. They rec recognize it as themselves. Uh, other animals, such as certain primates and certain birds, uh, can use tools. Uh, and that requires a certain amount of planning ahead. You have to have uh, kind of an imagination to some degree to uh, anticipate the consequences of using a tool, decide they're what you want, uh, and then use the tool. So there are there is evidence uh, of some level of consci consciousness in other animals. Are they fully self-aware? We don't know. Probably not for most of them. Um, again, there are certain animals like chimps, like dolphins, uh, that seem to have higher levels of cognition, uh, whether they have the same level of cognition that we do, uh, remains to be seen. Again, consciousness is very subjective. Uh, it's almost impossible to measure, so we may never know the answer to that question. Uh, when it comes to the brain, uh, we can look at these levels of consciousness, measure brain activity, uh, and we see that there are a number of areas, they're large, so we're not going to detail them, uh, in the frontal and parietal lobes, uh, that change activity levels based on the level of consciousness. So here in this diagram on the bottom right, uh, these dark patches on the brain are actually levels, uh, decreased levels of activity. So these represent deactivation. And as you move down from one row to the next, you see those patches expand. Uh, so someone who's just merely asleep, parts of their brain are deactivated a little bit compared to being awake. Uh, but if you go all the way to the bottom, to that persistent vegetative state where the person is unresponsive, doesn't seem to respond to stimuli, you have much larger areas of the brain that are inactive or less active relative to the normal waking state. So there are correlates between levels of consciousness and levels of activity in the brain. Okay, so we have these different levels of consciousness. And the question is, even if we're fully conscious, uh, what is it that occupies our minds? What do we think about? Uh, and the answer is oftentimes not whatever, whatever it is we're doing. Uh, there's a lot of daydreaming and mind wandering that happens, uh, especially if we're doing something that is repetitive or boring or not particularly mentally engaging. Uh, and we know a lot about daydreaming and mind wandering and in internal mental life uh, due to a technique called experience sampling. And this is where the person will have a pager, or more recently, uh, will get a text message on their cell phone. Uh, and whenever they get one of these messages, they're supposed to uh, record what it is they're doing, what it is they're thinking about, what it is they're feeling uh, at that moment. And the reason it's done that way is that if you ask people to report at the end of the day, uh, it's often not very accurate for a number of reasons. First, uh, it's just exhaustive trying to, try, try, uh, trying to come up with a list. Uh, of all the things you did today, your your likelihood of remembering all of them is tiny. Uh, second, you're, you're more likely to come up with things that are important, uh, and which of course is not the point of the exercise. We want to get an entire picture of mental life. And then third, uh, you run into demand characteristics. So people will report uh, experiences, thoughts that that portray them in a more positive light. For example. Uh, when you ask people how much they enjoy taking care of their children, they report that they love it, that it's the most rewarding part of their day. Uh, when you actually use this experience sampling technique uh, and ask them what they're doing and how they feel about it, uh, it turns out that taking care of children ranks just above housework, uh, which people don't enjoy very much. Uh, and, and so we, we have a way of quantifying uh, emotions and daily activities and what people are concerned with, uh, both in terms of frequency, how often they think about this, uh, but also how they feel about it, uh, how it how it contributes to their inner mental life. And again, this would not be possible uh, if you, or at least accurate, uh, if you asked somebody to just report all their thoughts and activities at the end of the day. Uh, when it comes to mind wandering, and I'm not going to distinguish between daydreaming and mind wandering here, uh, 
we can look at brain activity while people's minds are wandering. And we see activity in uh, regions of the brain that together are called the default network. And the idea here is that these are the, act the regions that are active by default uh, when you're not engaged in some task. As soon as you become engaged in a task, then the relevant parts of the brain become active. Uh, but then when you're just lying there, mind wandering, uh, these are the areas in the frontal uh, and parietal lobes near the midline of the brain uh, that, that become active. And so these are what are known as the default network. Uh, now, what's interesting is that we're very good at mind wandering, letting our minds drift. Uh, we're not so good at controlling the contents of our minds. We can to a certain degree. Uh, but in particular, we're terrible at trying not to think of something. So this is an activity known as thought suppression. Uh, the classic example is try not to think of a white bear. And of course, as soon as you get the instruction, you think of one. Uh, but even after that, you'll notice when you're trying not to think of it that it keeps popping to mind. Uh, and so that is how ineffective we are at thought suppression. Now, uh, what's interesting is if you have someone try to suppress that thought uh, for a few minutes and then afterwards tell them to stop and to actually think of the white bear or whatever stimulus they, they were trying not to think of, uh, you get what's known as the rebound effect, uh, where you were suppressing it before uh, and now you're trying to think of it, but it turns out you can think of little else. Uh, it, it, it pops up very frequently. Uh, whereas if you weren't told to suppress it before, you're told to think of it now, at first you think of it pretty often, but then your mind wanders, you start to think of other things. You don't think of it so much. Uh, so not only are we not, are we not very good at suppressing thoughts, uh, if we try to, Afterwards, after we stop trying to suppress them, uh, that thought will come back even more strongly. And this is one of a number of things that are called ironic processes. Uh, so when we're trying not to do something, not to make some behavior, or trying not to think of something, uh, often it's the very thing that we end up thinking about or doing. Uh, so we're trying not to commit some behavior, uh, and we end up doing it. And we wonder, well, maybe it would have been better off if I just hadn't thought of it at all in the first place, instead of trying to actively not think about it. Uh, and, and the reason we think this happens is that, not consciously, you might be able to keep it out of your consciousness, but there's some monitoring process going on unconsciously. Uh, and that unconscious monitoring process has to activate that concept to some degree because it has to look for it. It has to search for whether that behavior or that thought is active. Uh, and so when we try not to do something or try not to think about something, uh, we end up with this ironic process where it ends up happening anyway. And that brings us to the unconscious mind. And this is a concept that's evolved over the history of psychology. So Freud, for example, one of the founders of psychology, uh, came up with the idea of the dynamic unconscious. Uh, this was a certain degree later refined into the idea of the id. Uh, we'll get more into Freudian theories of, of the psyche in our unit on personality. Uh, but either of these concepts, and you're, and you're probably more familiar with the id, uh, is the idea that we have some consciousness, which Freud would go on to call the ego, uh, and it has these other influences on it, uh, one of which is the id, this unconscious process. You also have the superego. I'm not going to go into that now. Uh, we'll get into it later. But you have these unconscious influences on our conscious behavior. And for Freud, the id, or the dynamic unconscious, uh, contained hidden memories. So unpleasant, traumatic experiences uh, that you didn't want to think about, that were unpleasant. Uh, or instincts and drives that, if you express them, would be unpleasant for you or would be socially unacceptable in some way. Uh, and so you, you hide these things. You, you try not to express them, uh, but they end up staying resident in the unconscious. Uh, and there are a number of ways that, that Freud proposed that you deal with these unconscious thoughts and impulses. Uh, and these are what we call defense mechanisms. So if you've ever heard that term, defense mechanism, that comes from Freud. Uh, and the idea is that we have these unconscious uh, methods for dealing 
with these unconscious impulses and thoughts for avoiding them. Uh, and there are a, a number of different ones that Freud proposed. You may have heard of denial or rationalization. These come from Freud. Uh, your book mentions repression, uh, where you actually sort of hide these memories. They are not accessible to your conscious mind anymore. Uh, and Freud's theories have a number of problems with them. The most, first, first and foremost, uh, they're not really falsifiable. They're not very scientific. Uh, and the repression, repressed memories, got a lot of attention uh, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but actually were, were a big problem because people were uh, coming up with memories of uh, abuse that had happened uh, when, in fact, these, these events had not occurred. Now, obviously, abuse and traumatic events do occur. They are unfortunate, but they happen. Uh, but people were mistaking suggested memories uh, for repressed ones. Uh, and so Freud's conception of the unconscious uh, is sort of this, this dark conglomeration of drives and urges and memories that we don't want to experience or express. Uh, the more modern understanding of the unconscious is what we call the cognitive unconscious. Uh, and this is to say that it's not that we're consciously aware of everything. Uh, it's just that the contents of the unconscious aren't necessarily what Freud thought they were. So there are a lot of mental processes that we don't directly experience. Uh, we don't know where memories come from. We try to remember something, and we either succeed or we fail. Um, we don't have access to that kind of low-level mental process. Uh, we experience our visual world as a series of objects, uh, when in fact our visual system is, is made up of different processes that build objects up from simple stimuli, like lines, simple shapes, light and dark colors. Uh, and constructs objects out of that. But we don't have access to those lower processes. Uh, what's also uh, uh, an increasingly prominent part of psychology when it comes to the unconscious uh, is what, are, what is known as a dual process theory. Uh, the idea that we have a conscious process that's slow and deliberate, that really thinks about a stimulus and comes up with a plan of action. But we also have an unconscious process uh, now, these are often called System 1 uh, for the unconscious process and System 2 for the conscious and deliberative one. Uh, and this is illustrated really well in the book Thinking Fast and Slow uh, by Daniel Kahneman. It's a good book. I show it here. Uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, but the idea is that we have both of these processes uh, because they're both useful in different contexts. So System 1 is fast and automatic. It's unconscious. Uh, we don't have to sit there and think about it. We don't have to take the time. System 2, we get a better answer many times. Sometimes System 1 is sufficient. But System 2, we really sit there, think about it, and plan out the best course of action and think about consequences. It takes longer. It takes more mental energy. Uh, and so it depends on your circumstance which one might be the better one to use. If you're in a complex situation you've never been in before, System 2 is probably the way to go. Uh, if you're walking through the woods at night uh, and you hear something behind you, uh, system one, the automatic response, might be the better way to go. Uh, you don't want to sit there thinking about potential danger if your life is in peril. Uh, and so we see a parallel here uh, also with those two pathways to the amygdala that we discussed in our unit on emotion. We have that direct pathway where the emotion or where the amygdala can respond uh, without really processing the stimulus. And we have the pathway through the cortex where the stimulus is processed more fully. Uh, but again, the idea here is that we have a conscious deliberative process and an unconscious automatic fast process. Uh, and using the wrong one can get you into trouble. Uh, you also have unconscious perception. So you've probably heard of subliminal messaging uh, where a stimulus is presented and you're not consciously aware of it it can nevertheless affect your behavior. Uh, in our unit on learning, uh, we talked about priming, the ability for uh, a stimulus to affect later behavior, and often it's a stimulus we're not aware of. Uh, it, it was presented too quickly, for example, and yet it can affect later behavior like word recall uh, or what thoughts pop to mind. They can, they can influence, at this unconscious level, uh, our mental processing. 
And the thing here is that the unconscious mind, especially when it comes to system one, is fast, but it's pretty limited. So your, your book talks about a couple of different experiments. Uh, one in which the unconscious process, system one, can't really process complex stimuli. It looks at things one at a time. So negative words, when combined, you might get a positive, a double negative, so to speak. Uh, your book uses the phrase, enemy loses. Well, we want our enemies to lose. So that would be a positive. But the unconscious process treats those as a negative stimuli uh, when it comes to emotional content. Uh, however, if you're told to evaluate a complex set of stimuli, uh, your unconscious can actually do a pretty good job, it turns out. Uh, so if you consciously evaluate the stimuli, in this case I believe it was uh, potential roommates, uh, your conscious mind can do a pretty good job, but if you're otherwise occupied, your unconscious processes seem to, to process those stimuli uh, for a while afterwards and can come up with a, a pretty good, if not a superior, decision. So the unconscious exists and, and even has a role in cognition. Okay, that will do it for our unit on consciousness. Uh, next time we'll start looking at thought, how we think and make choices. We'll look at decision making. Uh, we'll start with concepts, how, how the mind groups similar ideas into abstract concepts. Then we'll go on to decision making. Uh, in particular, what mistakes we tend to make, why we tend to make those mistakes, uh, how we can counteract them. And then finally, we'll wrap up that unit with uh, looking at creativity uh, and insight to how we solve problems creatively, and also reasoning. How do we reach conclusions? How do we make deductions? Are they valid or are they not? And what influences that process? Uh, so that will be next time, and I will see you then.